Hello, everyone, and welcome to Restoring the Future, Investing in a Healthy Reef. I'm Beth Roberts, Director of Strategy and Capability here at Greening Australia, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Before we begin, and in the spirit of reconciliation, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and any other Indigenous people who have joined us here today. You've all dialed in from around Australia and potentially abroad, so please do let us know where you're from by using the chat with all panellists and attendees option in the chat box to the right hand side of your screen. I invite you also to use that chat box to post any questions for our panellists as they arise during the discussion. And we'll get to just as many of those as we can in the final 15 minutes today. So let's talk about the Great Barrier Reef, one of the seven wonders of the natural world, the world's largest collection of corals and marine life and can arguably, arguably be termed a natural inspiration for all of us. But perhaps it's also the most in urgent environmental challenge to protect the reef from things like poor water quality, pest invasion, of course, human encroachment and climate change. To put climate change in context for you in February 2020, so just last year, the GBR experienced the warmest sea surface temperature on record since 1900, and that was just 1.25 degrees above average. A month later, scientists reported a mass bleaching event resulting in uh, a widespread coral loss. So with that in mind, CSIRO just this month published a report trying to understand people's connection to the Barrier Reef. And the report showed that 94% of those people surveyed considered the loss of the reef a really big problem. So what can we do about it? Well, that's exactly why we're here today. In this webinar, we're going to explore how market-based approaches can provide financial returns whilst also helping to protect the Great Barrier Reef. To discuss this topic, we have two special guests with us today, our panellists, James Schultz and Dr. Lanice Wern. James Schultz is the CEO of Green Collar, an innovative pioneer in nature-based solutions and a global leader in carbon, water quality, biodiversity and plastics environmental markets. Dr. Lanice Wern is the Director of Greening Australia's Reef Aid Program, working to improve water quality and combat climate change by collaborate, collaborating with landholders, communities and traditional owners to re rebuild eroding gullies and restore wetlands across the Great Barrier Reef catchment. We're privileged to have them both join us today from Sydney and also in Brisbane. I'd like to introduce and welcome James Schultz and Lanice Wern. Welcome to you both. Thanks, Beth. It's great to be here. Yeah, actually sitting in the Cairns office today, staring <laughs> out at the um, harbour right now. So, Fantastic. You're in the right place for this discussion then. Thanks for joining us, both of you. We've only got an hour to get through some discussion and, and get to some questions from those that are joining us. So we'll um, metaphorically dive right in to today's questions, if that's okay with you both. Let's begin with some foundational knowledge, James. Um, can you explain to us what blue carbon and reef credits are and ultimately how the carbon market can help support the reef? Yeah, thanks, Beth. Uh, great, great place to start. Um, so uh, the, the, the concept of these markets are that um, we can deliver positive environmental outcomes uh, by purchasing them in effect. And so the, the concept here, when we talk about blue carbon um, and in the case of um, the reef credit market, uh, water quality improvements, so that's uh, dissolved in organic nitrogen runoff reductions and sediment reductions is that we can actually price the cost or the impact of these um, pollutants, uh, these emissions, and then find somebody that is prepared to uh, purchase those costs because they are the ones that have uh, a need to reduce them. And so in the context of, say, blue carbon, uh, we're looking at restoring mangrove um, areas, uh, uh, um, uh, seagrass uh, habitat, et cetera, because we're trying to reduce emissions at a global scale. And Australia, as you would know, has commitments under the UNFCCC, the Paris Agreement, to reduce its emissions. And so with carbon, we can put a price on that. And that price is to incentivize those that have the opportunity to undertake the activities that would 
increase mangrove habitat or increase seagrass habitat. And similarly with the uh, water quality improvements, and we're using a new market that we've developed over the uh, course of the last few years, uh, partnering uh, with Greening Australia, but uh, many others, including the, the sugar industry here in North Queensland, where we are looking to find ways to, again, reduce dissolved inorganic nitrogen runoff and reduce sediment runoff uh, by paying landholders uh, an incentive that allows them to undertake land use practice change or land use practice improvement that increase that improves things like nitrogen use efficiency. And that then subsequently results in a water quality improvement uh, and ultimately a better outcome for the reef. Great, James. So what you've described there is, you know, significant work and incentive for landholders to actually support the reef, which is part of the ultimately their catchment. Lenise, can you expand a little bit on what environmental work really underpins the financial concepts that James spoke about? And can you describe the kind of impact that this work has been able to deliver, particularly with your program? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Beth. Um, and I guess, you know, the two biggest threats to the reef are climate change and water quality. And, you know, I think through the work Green Australia is doing is to focus on both those aspects. So some of our sort of goals across Green Australia is around, you know, restoring 330,000 hectares and also planting 500 million trees. And so that's really to look at, you know, the biggest threat, climate change, and uh, sequester carbon. And the other major sort of threat to the Great Barrier Reef is water quality. Uh, and so our reef aid program, which started five years ago, was really focused on the two biggest pollutants, that's sediment and din, as James alluded to. And the work we're doing is around, you know, looking at the highest priority areas that are producing the sediment. So some of those gully areas, and we're looking and we remediate those gullies. And as soon as we do that, automatically we get a, the sediments reduced by, you know, up to 90%. Uh, straight away as soon as we do that. Uh, and then in our wetland systems, we're actually putting in treatment systems to actually reduce uh, the din or the nitrates which are going down to the Great Barrier Reef. And so the last, last five years alone, we've stopped 22,000 tonnes of sediment going down to the Great Barrier Reef and also restored over 700 hectares of coastal wetlands. But certainly this is, I guess, a touch in the ocean really of what's required to actually have an impact on where we need to get to. So you've spoken there about some really large scale programs, Lenise, and, and obviously to do that kind of work, you need um, financial investment to enable the science and the, and the work to actually happen. James, back to you. We've talked about, um, you know, the incentive for, for people to get involved and environmentally what that can mean, what the impact of that uh, work can actually deliver for the Great Barrier Reef. But how does this on ground work actually correlate to financial returns for those investors? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I... And that, that's sort of the, the starting premise, right? That uh, this needs to be financially attractive. Uh, that really, so if we get back to, to basics here and we look at the scale of investment that we need to take on some of these problems, you, you quickly realise that we're not going to get there through public finance alone. Uh, and they are some significant challenges that we're taking on. And uh, if we uh, think in, in the, the context of climate change and um, the water quality problems that Lenise just outlined, and so if you recognise that public finance won't, won't deliver what we need, you've got to think around how do you actually um, mobilise the private capital and the, the resources of the private sector to start to deliver those outcomes. And if you're going to do that, you need to find ways to actually deliver a return to both the landholder and a return to the purchaser of the credits. And so the, the starting point here is that uh, and this is something at, at Green Collar, um, we consider sort of one of our um, core planks of how we think, or think about um, projects is that incentives work a hell of a lot better than regulation. If you want good land management outcomes, you need to invest back in the land. Uh, you don't do it by putting less resources. You don't do it by putting less capital into the properties. So the, the first point is we've got to understand if you want to... Um, uh, restore a gully, if you want to reforest a riparian area, uh, you want to sequester carbon, you want to uh, um, reduce the amount of runoff, it comes with a cost. What is that cost going to be? Uh, if we can understand that, uh, that gives us a baseline. But the more important and much more interesting question is what's it worth? 
And what's the value of protecting these systems? And that value is enormous. Uh, and if you know, there's been attempts to sort of uh, develop economic models before that try and put a price or a, a value on the Great Barrier Reef, and they're in the many, many billions of dollars. Um, and so if, and I think that, that that approach in itself is very reductionist because it's very hard to sort of define what is this um, intrinsic value that you were describing at the start, Beth, is one of the natural wonders of the world. Um, what uh, you know, climate change is this existential threat that um, you know, there's arguably no value, no economic value that you could put on trying to solve that problem. We must solve it. And so uh, when we start to understand that value, that helps us find the best way to get the most revenue into the farm gate that incentivizes landholders, graziers, pastoralists, indigenous groups to be able to undertake and uh, conduct the work that will deliver those outcomes. On the flip side, uh, who buys these things? What, what motivates them to buy? Uh, so there's a range of um, uh, purchases in the, in the demand space. The first is the compliance buyers. There are those organisations that have an obligation to reduce emissions. There are those organisations that have obligations to limit the impact of development on the reef, um, to reduce uh, nitrogen runoff, uh, sediment runoff. And so they are looking for opportunities to purchase units that can meet that obligation. And so that, that's a regulated market. Uh, and the, the participants in that are the, the large industries that you would be familiar with. You see them every day um, if you work in the reef space. And so it's a really great opportunity to help them solve a problem they need to solve and also uh, produce great land management outcomes. So that, that's the sort of compliance space. Uh, we have the government as a large purchaser. The government is a big investor, so that public capital does come into uh, play here. Uh, they, in the Australian context, they're purchasing through the Emissions Reduction Fund, which is federal government funding to purchase carbon credits. They're purchasing through the state-based Land Restoration Fund, which is a Queensland uh, fund that purchases carbon credits, where they put a particular premium on the, the what they consider the co-benefits. So if you undertake a carbon project, but you have a biodiversity benefit or a water quality benefit, how do we price that? And then we have uh, buyers in the ESG space. So those organisations that have shareholder pressure or other reasons that they have obligated themselves to reduce emissions, uh, reduce the impact of their operations on the environment that they are operating in. And that is a big driver and that is a very significant um, and growing market every year. And that's driven by uh, forward thinking companies that understand as part of their social license to operate they need to start thinking around what is the impact of the work that we do um, and how can we reduce it. It's those organisations that understand that their clients want to see and want to um, purchase from organisations that place high regard on delivering positive environmental and not just environmental, social and community benefits as well. So they're, they're the sort of two elements of the market. Um, how we actually bring that together, there's lots of um, different ways in, in how it actually practically happens. And we use a range of different market instruments. Uh, in the water quality, it's the reef credit space and the carbon space, it's the Australian Carbon Credits Act, what we you know as the Emissions Reduction Fund. And then we have a whole range of ways that we actually deliver this into the market through wholesale um, channels, retail channels, so on and so forth. Um, invariably, and this is the most important thing to understand about these markets is, most of that funding goes straight back to the property level, straight back into the projects themselves that Lanise was describing before. So, you know, fantastic work where we're restoring wetlands, we're repairing gullies, we're managing savannah burning, uh, changing grazing practice, um, working, I mentioned before, optimising nitrogen use efficiency, uh, all great things from a productivity standpoint as well, I might point out. So what I've heard there is that there are a range of um, investors potentially in that market. And you talked about uh, those coming at it from a compliance point of view. Obviously, there's some government and public investment and those corporations that have environmental and sustainability goals that they need to deliver to shareholders. So it certainly sounds like there is demand and complex demand. How would you um, describe the appetite at present from all of those investors that are interested in this space? Um, so it's a really exciting time to be playing in this market at the moment, um, which is fantastic. You know, the, if you think from the carbon perspective, 
Um, the, the market year on year has grown, although it has been challenged at time, challenging at times because it's a politically um, fraught topic some of the time. But the interesting thing is in a, the Australian context is despite that, um, the political tension, especially around the demand side of the market, there's always been bilateral um, support on the, the supply side of the market, which has been, has been a very positive thing. And so uh, slowly but surely that uh, supply side of the market has grown year on year on year. But right now, the demand side of the, the market is really taking off. I, I think 2019 was the first time that the global voluntary market had outpaced the global compliance market in development. And that is because, as this going to that sort of ESG comment I was making before, is that um, organisations are understanding that they need to take on these problems and that they don't, uh, shouldn't, can't and won't wait for government policy to catch up and compel them. And it's not entirely true for all industries. And this is not to dismiss the importance of uh, regulation and policy it plays a very important role so um, don't misunderstand me here but the growth is huge um, and the the market dynamics are such that uh, demand is much more significant than supply at this point in time in carbon that is the same uh, what we're seeing develop in the reef space uh, in terms of reef credit markets uh, and we only expect those conditions to continue um, as the market grows and evolves and becomes more sophisticated um, it presents new challenges. How do we respond to that level of demand? How do we structure longer term offtake agreements? How do we ensure that we continue to get the um, level of integrity that we must see for these projects to actually work? Because you know, the, the value proposition here is that you're paying for something that is very real, very easy to understand, very transparent. I think one of, and one of, this is actually a really interesting point here is that um, we often think of solving the climate change challenge um, as a challenge to switch to renewable energies, um, to uh, shut down coal powered fire stations, uh, to reduce our dependence on um, transport that has a high carbon footprint, switching to electric vehicles, etc. Clearly that is a, a, a big piece of the equation, but the emissions from the land sector is also a very big part of the challenge. It's 20% of Australia's footprint at times, globally I think it's in that order of magnitude. Some countries much higher. Um, similarly, we have a, a big footprint on, on the reef space. So these projects aren't simply about offsetting the emissions that are occurring in other, other sectors. They're actually about reducing emissions within the land sector. And that is a really important thing to remember that we must actually solve that problem in the land sector as a land sector problem, as much as um, we see the commercial opportunity to say, well, we can solve it more economically and more cost effectively right now than other organizations can. So Lenise, carrying on for that point, obviously, you know, there's a market and there's an appetite that's developing and growing at a certain pace. If we can come back to landholders, what opportunities do you think market based approaches um, to the reef health open up for those landholders that are sitting in catchments? I think James said it best, like, you know, incentivise rather than regulation, you're going to get far better outcomes. And I think, you know, working, you know, landholders are part of everything we do. We can't do anything we do without the partnerships with landholders. And so I think it's also incentivising and working with them and they get a financial benefit from making those improvements on their land. And it also gives longevity for that improvement as well. So I think the so certainly the opportunity for landholders is certainly around, you know, especially low productive land uh, to get a financial uh, benefit for that um, and also to enable their, you know, improve your land condition and productivity through it as well and also get an incentive payment through reef credits and things like that to do that. It also uh, provides additional revenue beyond, I guess, their normal, um, I guess, income they might get from, you know, sugar or grazing and things like that. And, you know, crediting period could be up to 25 years. So the ongoing revenue source to actually make those changes on their land. So that's a really strong incentive there. And I think finally, I think, you know, we've been really locked into some of these grant space projects to do these on ground works, which has been really important, especially to get our pilot projects up and get some of the learnings. I think one of the key things there is that there is also some ongoing maintenance, which is required as part of those projects. And having a three-year project cycle doesn't enable 
uh, that ongoing maintenance to be paid for. And so landholders are often left with that. So I think through this, um, I guess the market-based instrument allows ongoing maintenance to actually be funded and also to landholders to get that payment so they can keep going on with that maintenance. And they're not, not just left with something, but they actually have to do ongoing management for and pay for it themselves. So I think that's a really strong component. Mm. So if the market-based approach offers, you know, long-term benefits to individual landholders, which you've, you know, explained really well, when we think about scaling environmental impact, so just past the single or group of landholders, what, what opportunities do these kinds of approaches really enable to see that large scale environmental um, impact or restoration? Yeah, look, I think that's what this is all about, right? And, and, you know, at, at, from green collars perspective, especially. And so, you know, we measure our success, not simply um, in terms of commercial return. We are a for-profit business, but we're a profit for purpose business. And we measure this in terms of impact. And for us, what is interesting is to see landscape level change. We've got, we've got to have that landscape level impact if we're actually going to solve the problem. And so, and that goes back to that sort of earlier point I was making at the start was that we need a significant amount of investment that goes well beyond what the uh, public finance can can reasonably be expected to invest. Uh, it also goes to the point that you need to find ways to then um, generate that return. So we um, are thinking around it at scale, how do we actually get there? You've got to get liquidity into these markets. You've got to get the uptake. You've got to get the usage and you've got to move the conversation away from cost, which is sort of uh, where the grant based uh, conversation starts and move it towards value. Like, why are we trying to fix this thing? It's not to, it's not, I've got a purse of a million dollars that I need to get out the door. So where do I find somewhere to spend it? It's that, We've got a long-term land management challenge here. We want to ensure best practice. You know, very rarely, in fact, I can't think of an example of working with a land manager where they think, you know what, I'm going to go out and bugger the environment today. It, it doesn't happen. Most of the people that are on the land are there because they love the land. And so what they want to do and is develop and you know invest in developing good land level like nature-based solutions we're calling it now before it was regenerative agriculture or sustainable land management or um, natural resource management all these different words and basically saying we want to invest back in we want productive outcomes we want good environmental outcomes how do we do that we've got to find the value and that's what these market-based mechanisms do if you find the value people start thinking differently about how they manage their assets and we have seen this happen really really well where it's been effective to at pricing things we've seen uh, people go from thinking that uh, this conversation is a greenies versus um, um, industry conversation to a place where I can take you out to parts of uh, the country, Western New South Wales, you sit around the kitchen table and you'll get schooled in the ins and outs of the Kyoto Protocol and the carbon price. Uh, and this is like the, the sort of, if you're sort of in, in inner city Melbourne, Sydney, you probably think of this as you know, conservative heartline, sort of the area of resistance. Well, it's not the case. And that's that's changed not because people have said, I want to adopt your view and share your values. It's changed because we've been able to effectively price things. And so you start thinking about it differently. It becomes part of everyday decision making. And all of a sudden, the economy is operating in a different way. And that's why we get to that landscape level impact that we need to that you're asking about. Uh, yeah, I'm hearing really strongly the concept of value coming through in, in what you're both saying and, and potentially that, that idea of translating non-financial value or, or what it's worth into financial value. And that's that's what this is all about. James, given that this is a relatively new market in Australia in terms of blue carbon and that impact investing has a paradigm around it that is you got to risk to, to get some return. you got to risk it to get the biscuit. What risk do you think is associated with investment in the reef in this sense? Yeah, so look, I think, and I'll just to clarify, so we are talking about more than just carbon, right? We're talking about a range of ecosystem services. And I, this is a really important point for us because what we want to do is really explicitly value all each of those services. What we don't want to do is conflate it all together and say, well, here's a carbon project, so a blue carbon project, for instance, um, and it does all this other nice stuff for the environment. So instead of selling the carbon credit at $10, we'll sell it at $12. Well, 
what we want to do is say, well, the carbon price is at 10, um, but someone over here, uh, their priority is actually to solve the water problem and they'll pay $30 or $50 or $100 a kilo because of uh, for din reduction or sediment reduction. So let's sell the water quality benefit to them. These guys over here are interested in the biodiversity benefit. So let's sell the biodiversity benefit to them. So we can, now we do obviously also bring that back together and we do sell it as a bundle and a package, but it, uh, we shouldn't assume that we do. And so those water quality markets are trying to do with the nitrogen, the sediment problem, blue carbons dealing with the emissions and the abatement uh, problem slash opportunity. The risk question, risk question is, um, not that different to any other uh, industry that you would be investing in. You're looking at the same metrics. So uh, has this been done before? Um, if not, uh, what is the state of the science? Are the methodologies currently approved? Has it been done somewhere else in the world? What is the test case? How do we do that? And then how can we, knowing the answers to those questions, offset some of that risk? So if we think of it uh, in the way um, if people have uh, been investing in so impact investors have done a lot in the renewable space. Uh, having offtake in place allows you to invest in the same way that if you had a power purchase arrangement in the energy sector, you could invest in a wind farm because you know if you get it to work, you will have somebody to go and buy. So first part of the impact investing story is if I create it, will I be able to buy, sell it? So the answer to that question is yes. Uh, we do know that we're going to be able to sell it. Uh, then the next question is, uh, what price and when will I be able to sell it? Um, and that then allows you to figure out how much capital you want to risk. One of the challenges that you've got with blue carbon is a lot of the opportunity is in public land uh, and it's in um, the um, estuarine environment or riparian zones that um, are not as simple as they, you know, the simplest is dealing with freehold land well above the, the um, tide mark, right? And when we go into these sort of uh, areas where there's lots of stakeholders, that piece becomes more complicated, trying to figure out how do all the stakeholders come together? What are the uh, interests where, and this is another really important part of, I think what we're trying to do with these projects is we're trying to find where the alignment of interest is all the time. Um, I can see, you know, questions are flicking up the, um, in the chat window in my eye, which I know I'm not meant to be paying attention to, but it's interesting because they're asking really good questions. Um, how do we deal with, say, corruption? How do we ensure long-term sustainable outcomes? These are all the same questions that Lenise and I and the team are asking ourselves every day. Uh, and so that is about finding what is it that we need to see? What are the appropriate guide rails to make sure these investments are delivered in the right way? That's why I was saying before about transparency is a, a key piece. Uh, you've got to have, it's not, a, it's not a case that James writes a methodology and we go and create a credit. Uh, we need to have all the people that are involved in the supply side, all the people that are involved in the demand side have confidence in those methods. We have to have them peer reviewed. We have to have them independently audited. We have to be able to go back and check at any point in time that the activity we say is happening is happening. And we have to respond as the science evolves to recalibrate, address and improve uh, the predictions that we get. And we have to be conservative in our estimates. So if we think um, something uh, might be, say sequestering a hundred tons of carbon per year, but there's a high level of uncertainty around that hundred ton number, well, we don't work with that hundred ton number. And we reduce it right back to where, what are we certain about? Is it 10 tons? Um, and we start from there. So they're the sort of things that we are constantly thinking about. And that's how we mitigate those risks that impact investors are thinking about. So we want to be able to, what's the worst case scenario if we were to go ahead and invest this project? What does it look like? And does that provide the return on capital that you're looking for? And you've got to be, to, be prepared to invest for the long term. Like if, if you want um, uh, a one or two year turnaround, um, then it's probably not the space to be investing because that's not how this, you know, that's not the way to approach a, a land management investment. It's not the way you would approach an agricultural investment. These are uh, long-term long -term opportunities. But if you do it, the returns are fantastic. So you've talked there about essentially a proof of concept, really, and, you know, creating a marketplace where the supply and demand sides of that marketplace are, are on board or a part of that testing and really understanding the concept has been proven. Let's just unpack the, the risk a tiny bit more in that um, 
my, my question to you is thinking about the financial risk of investing, how do you weigh that up against the risk of not investing, i.e. the risk to natural capital, which, you know, you early, said earlier has had some extraordinary numbers associated with it. So how do, how do you weigh those two things up? Yeah, I, I can answer that again. I, I feel That'd like be great. Thanks, James. Rabbiting on a bit, so feel free to cut me off when it's... Um, but, the, yeah, it, from our, so where I stand in particular, I know where Lenny stands. Um, if we're talking about our two organisations, uh, we would have a, a distinctly... Um, a, a distinctive view which would say that there is a f um, overwhelming um, risk... Uh, like. Uh, it's not even a, a, a quantifiable risk. You just have to do this stuff, right? Like we don't sit there and sort of weigh up, should we or shouldn't we mm. do this? And I kind of think like, one of the things I like about what we do is we don't have to get permission to go out and do this stuff. Like we can just start getting on with the job. Um, and the more that we do, the more people see that there's value in it, the more that we'll follow. Um, so in that respect, I think um, there is no way um, ahead other than just start doing this stuff. But that's from our perspective of organisations that are deep inside the space. If you're outside that and you're just looking at this purely from an investment standpoint, well, our job is to make the business case stand up. So our job is to treat this like you would treat any other investment decision. And when you guys say there is risk, um, we want to turn around and find you the ways to mitigate those risks. Can we do it with financial structure? Can we do it with the way we actually design the project? Uh, can we do it with, you know, long-term offtake arrangements? So blue carbon might be new, but the carbon market's not new. So we know if we create carbon credits, we can sell them. As, this is what I was saying before. So there's lots of different ways to mitigate that risk. I don't think it's useful to think of it and uh, expect investors to start investing on the basis that um, you might not get a return. Um, so just put your money in and see what happens. And that's part of the problem with the way grants kind of work um, because you um, you then risk that uh, people sort of will do the work, write the report, um, but they don't come back and check did the actual activity do what it was going to do. These markets are probably skipped over this, but very important. It's a pay for, pay for performance type mm. scenario. Um, so if something doesn't happen, it's not delivered. Um, so, you know, what we do as an organisation, um, when we, we act, we invest and we will invest on the basis that say we know that um, we have a offtake arrangement with a large corporate that says we want a particular kind of credit out of a particular area. And I go, okay, well, we know if we create those credits, we will um, invest our own time, energy and capital. And we are doing this with Greening Australia, for example, in restoring this wetland. Um, we can quanti we're best placed to quantify and understand that risk because we do that every day of the week. Um, we might borrow capital then, and we might make the decision, okay, we want to borrow capital. At what interest rate would we be prepared to borrow that? And so there are pools of capital that are discounting based on the type of project, and this is the impact investment pool that we're talking about. Uh, but they're still going to expect us to deliver the project. They're still going to expect us to... Um, uh, make good if we fail to deliver and that's something that we need to manage we can manage it by scale that is one of the ways we manage it too as an as an example so you know, we we operate about 15 million hectares of land through um, partnership with uh, privately land um, privately held um, and lease held land right throughout the country uh, working with a range of organizations so all of those projects are creating credits, creating abatement, creating um, impact. Uh, so we can manage that supply and demand relationship and that's the way we mitigate that risk. We're well placed to mitigate that risk. Um, that's quite different, say, if you're an individual landholder, you shouldn't take on that. Not necessarily, maybe, but not. Um, you don't want to necessarily be the one that has to find that um, carbon credit if the project didn't deliver the credit that you're expecting in the year that you're expecting because you're not well placed to go into the market. So. Anyway, a range of ways is basically the answer. <laughs> Thanks, James. Lenise, I'm really interested in your take on this. So, you know, this is the, the, the risk that investors might have from a financial perspective on trying to get a return on their investment versus the risk that you see of not having that investment and what the ultimate impact is on natural capital. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think risk is a really big thing. And I think for reef credits, 
having like worked through the methodologies there, you know, I guess to ensure and give, um, I guess, surety to investors that they're very onerous in terms of uh, the monitoring requirements. You know, you're monitoring at, you know, the gully level, you're actually monitoring the sediment and quantifying that. So I think there's a lot of confidence. I think there's been some questions around, you know, corruption and things like that, that it's very onerous, especially because it's a new environmental market and you are trying to give that confidence back to investors that what they're investing, they're actually getting. Uh, so I think that's a real key um, item. And I think with landholders, um, I think there's those different mechanisms around sharing risk and that's different models depending on what landholders might want to um uh, I guess be involved in that. Do they want an annual payment that might be based on, uh, I guess, their own cash flow? Do they just want to base it on when reef credits flow through, which might be every two years or three years? So there's different levels of risk that landholders can take on as well. Uh, so I think, um, especially with the new environmental market, I just have to say, yeah, that it's very onerous in terms of the monitoring and then the risk can be shared, you know, be taken on for ourselves or Green Co, as James said, also landholders can take on some risk as well, but it's all shared risk, I guess, which is really key. And I guess that other factor around not investing, I think James put out some numbers before, I mean, not investing, the reef itself, you know, is support 64,000 jobs. And, you know, it's a six, $56 billion economy. So the risk of actually not doing this work um, is huge in terms of social, economic, um, you know, the value, the brand it brings to Australia. Um, so I, I don't think we can, we put a price on it, but we can't afford not to actually be doing this. And I think the way that we're talking around now, we're talking about scaling, incentivising and valuing, um, you know, those environmental um, assets and putting a value on that and also incentivizing landholders to make that change and voting that back to themselves as well. So, yeah, I think that's, you know, really key here. I think you're making an important point here, Lanise, about the cycle and, and how that initial investment actually results in benefits to the investor. And I'm going to break protocol a little bit here because there's a question that, that is relevant that I want to draw to your attention. So, Lanise specifically, you've got a question here from Michelle. Can you describe an example of one of GA's most successful projects in this space and talk perhaps about some specific benefits for the investor? Uh, so, I guess we're still in the reef credit development space, but I guess one of our most successful projects to date, and while it hasn't been um, a reef credit project, it certainly was set up uh, in terms of the monitoring requirements around that. So that was around remediating large gully um, areas in uh, the Burdick catchment, so it's a high priority areas. And those works uh, straight away, we had baseline assessments, so I think there was around 6,000 tonnes of sediment coming out of those um, those gully spaces each year. And so once they're remediated and doing the monitoring and that's based on sort of flows coming through each wet season that we would expect to, you know, get potentially up to 10,000 reef credits, which could actually be actualized from that space per year. Um, so depending on what the price of the reef credit could be, that would give the uh, investment back uh, based on um, how many reef credits could be produced from that work alone. Yeah. And it's, it's important to understand where we are in this cycle. So, you know, we, we literally only had the first tranche of credits issued just before Christmas. Exactly. So the, the yeah. next eight projects are going through um, um, uh, audit right now. I, all the credits that are coming off those projects have already been sold. Um, so uh, we're, we're very much in the early days of that mm. market. Um, there's some there. I mean, there's some great examples also in the carbon space. Some of the stuff you guys are doing over in WA as well, Lenise, the um, yeah. with forage belts and such. So you know, there's a there's a whole host. Mm. I mean, the, the the carbon market in Australia from a land perspective is a is a great story. You know, we've seen huge investment, just not just our organisations, but right across uh, the industry, um, and lots of innovation. You, know, you want to see where. Um, some of the most exciting and innovative uh, practices are happening in the country. Go to rural Australia and you'll see some fantastic stuff. Yeah. Um, so, you know, some lots of good examples um, in the um, what we're working on at the moment. Also, we're working on uh, wetland restoration. Um, uh, a number of wetlands between here um, 
um, all the way down. Uh, so like Russell River, Johnston, um, Herbert, um, and further south. Uh, and the, the great thing about this, by the way, especially what's really cool about the reef problem, by the way, is that it's so, so achievable in a short period of time to solve some of these challenges. Uh, so climate change is a, is a um, you know, global challenge. You bring it down to the reef space, I guess climate change uh, is, a, is, is, the, is the biggest threat to the reef. reef. And that is a, a very challenge. You know, we're not going to uh, reverse the course of warming uh, in the next few years but we can actually solve water quality problems in the next few years we can actually go into catchments and say if we do this work here here and here we can come back two years, years later three years later and we can see the difference in water quality and that gives the reef a much much better chance of adapting to the climate change that is baked now into the system mm. and I, I think that's a really important thing mm. to understand around what we're doing in the reef space now why it is so important and why it's so important to be doing it now yeah and i think just to add on to that quickly i mean the most recent reef report card you know we're not we're not where we need to be so we do have to be doing something different here you know we need to incentivize landholders we've only got you know 30 percent of practice change of what we're trying to aim towards so you know we need to be changing this now we need to be doing this quickly and this is a way to actually start to change how we're doing things and actually scale and start to actually you know get the type of change that we actually require so let's pick up on that theme a little bit more and james you were you you said before that the car but the land-based carbon story is a really good one um and it's been around now for i don't know a couple of decades and this the the concept of water cred credits is relatively new by comparison Given the benefits of the short time frames and the change that you can see that you've both just described, what do you think the barriers were to this market actually um, getting up and up and running from a water perspective? Look, that that's a fantastic question, um, and I um, could wax lyrical about it for a long time. <laughs> it's hard to shift moment, like when you're operating on a particular. Um, um, in a particular paradigm and people are dependent on that paradigm to fund their sort of short-term horizon, it's difficult to break out of it. It is difficult. And so lots of people have recognized that we need to try and do this, but the bandwidth hasn't been there to try and get on and just do it. Now we, we had a, 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 a fantastic opportunity when uh, three or four years ago, maybe a little bit more, uh, with some of the investment that the Queensland government was making in North Queensland, in the in the Burdekin, um, um, up in the wet tropics as well, um, so uh, working with Terrain and um, NQ Dry Tropics, uh, and uh, where they were um, trying to do a few new things, and we had just started partnering with those organisations on carbon, and we were saying, look, this is a great opportunity. Why don't we like just push ahead and we'll just Let's set up a market. Why not? Um, and uh, it was a bit audacious in the sense that um, lots of people, so the, the, the people that are saying this is, we should all do this, um, also are the ones a lot of the time saying it's going to be very, very hard. Uh, and so whilst we got support to do it, um, that inertia I was just describing still is really hard to overcome. And so we get a lot of... Um, um, support in um, um, tentative support, but like actually being able to roll up the sleeves and get the, the job done um, and actually just get out and test things. Um, people have got to go about their everyday business in the meantime. And so uh, they sit there and things don't move as fast as you would like to see them move. So people get um, anxious. Oh, all this is talk again, what's happening, et cetera, et cetera. And so those are the sort of things that make doing things like this really, really hard. What we've been able to do here and why we were able to come this, we, we were just in the position that we um, were able to push ahead um, because we are able to resource ourselves. It's because this is our core business and we can commit to that longer, longer view and we can take the time to get people up the knowledge curve and we can wear the um, criticisms and we can also at the end of the day as I say what's great about this space is and some of the brilliant stuff Greening Australia has done by the way with gully restoration you know a lot of people said it can't be done 
Um, and so if you're sort of always operating from the point of view, oh, this is hard, it can't be done, um, you never get off and into the business of trying to find out, well, can it, is that true? Can we test that? So, you know, the great thing is we have been able to test that here. Um, and uh, you don't often get those opportunities, I think, is one of the reasons that this is, is so often challenging. Um, but uh, we, we have, we're proof that you can absolutely overcome those barriers. That's great. Thanks, James. And, and a, a really nice segue into a bit of a Q&A now. Um, we've had lots and lots of questions come through, so I'll work my way through them. For all of the attendees, if you have any further questions, please do post them in the chat. Just make sure that you chat with all panellists and attendees so that I can see them for you and we'll work through as many as we can. So, Lenise, starting with yourself, a question here from Kate, and this is a nice segue from what James was just describing about the market and how overcoming those big problems has gathered momentum, particularly for water credits. Mm. In the next five to 10 years, what do you see developing and how do you see this playing out um, from an ec ecosystem services or a Great Barrier Reef perspective? Oh, I, look, you know, everything you read now, and we're seeing this globally um, with... You know, we've had Biden come in, everyone's speaking differently with um, how they're seeing climate change and how they're viewing the environment and the risk of not doing anything. So I think it's really changing, um, you know, our, our goals and what we want to pay for, what we value. And I think that's also driving through into the markets as well. Like, you know, already we're seeing, you know, records in terms of sustainable bonds. It's increased in 2020. It's going to increase to $650 million in 2021. So I think we're seeing um, the market responding to actually having to invest in the environment and into, you know, sustainable environmental initiatives such as this. So I think we're definitely seeing that. And I think that's only going to increase over the next five and 10 years. Right. And further to that, Lenise, a question from Karen for you. How can we actually ensure that those that the environmental markets are supporting long term lasting impact for nature rather than what we might term as a quick fix in five to 10 years? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, certainly all the, um, you know, work we've been doing over the last few years, over the last five years, you know, our gully program alone was testing uh, it was an innovative gully project. So it was testing you know, all different treatments, which ones, you know, about cost effectiveness, what ones you should use for long lasting sustainability. And so they really drive how we actually design our works now. Uh, you know, we bring in engineers, we bring in, you know, geomorphologists, et cetera, to design the works. And we're designed for, you know, one in 100 year events. Uh, so we're really, really thinking beyond, you know, one or two years, we're really thinking about longevity of how these works will be maintained and have long lasting impacts. So that's really important in everything we do. And I think the second point is we're working with landholders that also um, are very invested into making a difference and wanna see change on their property. And so that's a really key partnership there with how we actually do the works. Thanks, Lenise. James, I'll come back to you for some comments that were posted early on in our session when we started talking about um, the concept of the market and, and potentially the corruption that might be at play. There's some comments here from both Sid and Valerie along that theme. And the, and the question for you is, uh, having heard of a huge, huge amount of corrupt payments being made by large offsets that don't improve anything or even continue destruction, what would you say to this? Look, I, so several things here um, and I think uh, there's oftentimes a conflation of ideas so I, I'm, I don't know that there's been any significant corrupt I, I've no, no instance of corruption in the Australian market there's certainly been uh, corruption in relation to per, um, so not um, carbon credits but um, uh, emissions allowances in the European Union where um, you had countries that were um, um, uh, overestimating their baselines that were then allowing, uh, sorry, underestimating the baseline that was a, a, a leading to an overissuance of permits that then could be on solved. But, but generally, there's always a risk of perverse outcomes, I agree, and that's what rules are there mm -hmm. to stop. Um, and so uh, in any industry, in any area where we're trying to work with markets, um, there is the risk that there will be some bad actors. Uh, and the idea is to capture those bad actors and 
find ways to continue to tighten the system to reduce the likelihood of those bad actors re-emerging. Um, so uh, that is an inherent risk, I think. And by the way, it, it happens with regulation. And I would say, uh, just as an anecdotal point to this, that one of the frustrations I think um, people have had that have been closely involved in this sector for a long time is that uh, just of a nature, I think, because of the things that we care about and where we come from, we tend to be hyper-focused on making sure we manage all these perverse outcomes, um, almost to the point of stopping action. And so one of the, um, I think, travesties of the last uh, 15 years is the fact that we had an opportunity you know, in the early 2000s to be able to solve a lot of the land clearing problem that's happening in Indonesia, New Guinea and other parts of the world. Uh, if we could have effectively brought the carbon price to bear at that point in time on that. Uh, we spent so much time arguing about the rules uh, because we wanted to get a perfect set of rules. What happened? The logging company that has no regard for, sorry, not the logging company, the logging industry that quite often in many instances has had little regard for corruption issues, uh, governance issues, environmental outcomes, perverse outcomes. And this is not to malign the logging industry at large, by the way. I'm sure there are those who are going to say, hey, but, but, you know, certainly that is a very corrupt industry in parts of Southeast Asia, as an example. And so we've seen huge land clearing happen on areas that could have otherwise been protected, uh, whilst we spent a lot of time arguing about the rules. And I think, you know, that, that's a really important lesson there in that for everyone, that um, if we worry about trying to get this perfect set of rules all the time, um, don't forget that there are other industries that are operating there that have a very, very different paradigm that don't care about the things that we're trying to, uh, that we care about here and about the problems that we're trying to solve. And so uh, that's not to say that corruption is, therefore we should accept corruption. Um, but I do think that we need to be um, understanding that we, we can't get perfect solutions to everything. We're trying to solve a very, very large problem and, most people, and in my experience, most of the participants are the good actors. They are trying to do the right thing. And then you'll have those at the edge that come in and say, you know, they might exploit it. They get caught. Um, you yeah, know, and I've seen examples. So uh, there are some examples in the Australian com uh, context of, say, developers that haven't um, delivered um, uh, against the expectations of those landholders. And, you know, we did a lot of work um, a few years ago to get an industry code of conduct up and running because we were concerned about those sorts of things. Um, the regulator has come back and, you know, it solves those problems. It recognises that there's a perverse outcome. Uh, not perfectly, but you learn those lessons and you uh, try not to let those mistakes happen the next time. Great. Thanks, James. Um, let's move on now to a question from Steve and we'll perhaps pose this to Lenise first and James you may have some ideas as well so Steve says in your opinion how prepared is the private sector positioned to deliver nature-based solutions and what are the opportunities moving forward um oh I think we're yeah I think we're you know really thinking differently with uh, measuring our impacts now like to you know so you could take to investor and they're very quantifiable. So I think very focused on how we actually do the works. Um, sorry, what was the second part to your question? Um, sorry, I just had a few more come yeah. in, so it's just yeah, scrolled yeah. down yeah, on me. Okay. Um, what, what do you think are the opportunities to really engage the private sector in delivering, delivering nature-based solutions into the future? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the beast space, um, you know, already, you know, we're looking at, you know, large wetland treatment systems and, you know, working with a range of different, um, you know, private, public, you know, industries to actually get those delivered. Um, I think there's opportunity around, you know, blue carbon projects introducing salt water, you know, back into these systems as well. And again, we're working with a range of, you know, um, from engineers to hydrogeologists, you know, to actually look at that and how we do that. Um, so I think we're definitely... Um, you know, thinking about costing this out, really measuring it on getting ready to actually put these uh, types of um, projects in the ground. Great. Thanks, Lanice. The future is obviously looking uh, pretty yeah. bright. Uh, we're, we're coming towards the end of time. So just a couple of more quick questions for you. Um, to either of you, what really do you think is the next step for blue carbon or, or for water credits? I mean, could it be said that the world quite literally is our oyster? 
Oh, I think absolutely. I think so. I mean, mm. yeah, I go back to what we're saying throughout this conversation. Um, it's in our hands, right? So it's, you know, um, there's no limit to the ideas and the um, ambition and you've just got to roll up the sleeves and start doing the work and we can do a huge amount. Um, we need lots of other people to come with us, but um, they're coming. And as Elise Nisa's point said, the, the, the capacity is there. Um, getting the, uh, our short-term objective, incidentally, um, you know, recognising you know, people are very interested in how all of this is coming to bear now. We've talked about it. Our sort of uh, short-term objective over the next 12 months is really to focus now on liquidity in the water quality context. So, you know, we've got the first projects. We've, as I said before, we've sold those uh, first credits. Now we really want to get to the point where this starts to become more like business as usual for water quality, like we've done business as usual for um, carbon. The blue carbon story is a, a little bit behind that because we've got pilot projects there. We've still got to test methodologies, but a huge amount of activity in the space right around the country and globally, I might point out. So, um, yeah, no end of things that we can do. What a, what a great note to um, draw us to a close on. And, and finally, uh, I know that we have a number of our founding supporters on this call and joining our webinar from both sides of Greening Australia and also for yourself, James. And just a shout out to all of them for helping us get to this point where we're really focused on scale and impact. And if we're going to have some global impact, that's where we need to start. Um, if either of you wanted to add anything there, please feel free. I, just, I think, oh, sorry. You go, Lynn. <laughs> um, oh, no, look, we're, you know, the conversations, you know, we're meeting with Green Collar all the time. Now conversations are, you know, we're looking at the next project. We're getting projects ready. Like, yeah, we're, we're trying to scale and everything we look at um, has that sort of, you know, reef credit or, you know, what sort of environmental market sits at the top of this. So I think it's a really exciting space, not only for us to be in, but also for landholders as well. A huge opportunity there. Um, and, you know, really exciting space to be in at the moment. I'd, I'd just like to say thank you very much for the opportunity to come and talk to you all. It's, um, it's great. Um, the more we get to do it, the more the ideas spread. And, you know, we, yeah. like, as I said, we're trying to shift the dial, move the um, bell curve um, up to the, the positive end of the spectrum, right, and change what um, best practice is and keep pushing those boundaries. So. Fantastic. Thank you both. That's all we've got time for, unfortunately, today, although we could, uh, as you say, James, wax lyrical for a while. It's been a really intriguing and interesting conversation. I thank you both for your time and for sharing your insights. It seems to me that as a community, we've got a really big job ahead of us to, to help protect the Great Barrier Reef for future generations. And it's uplifting to hear about the potential for private investment and really accelerating uh, the environmental work that you know you're both achieving to ensure a healthy reef so my thanks to you both thank you thanks to, to those of you on the call, if you'd like to provide any feedback on today's event or to connect with a member of the Greening Australia team, please contact us at communications at greeningaustralia.org.au and we'll post that email address into the chat function. Thanks everybody for your time today and we'll look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Bye for now. <laughs>